It's so good to see you. If you have your Bibles, hope you do. You can turn to Romans chapter 7. Uh, if you don't, you can grab your sermon outline there. And I would go ahead and turn to the summary section. Uh, we'll flip back and forth, but we'll, uh, we'll kind of walk through some of the points as we're going through the message today. It's so great to be with you and, and to see you as we continue the series uh, here in Romans chapter 7. You know, the, the old songwriter uses the lyric, we are not as strong as we think we are. There is part of me that just thought I would have been further along than this. No, I don't just mean filling in for Jason Kane on a Sunday morning. I'm not talking about that, but <laughs> I've, I've been a believer for 30-something years, and, and you told me back whenever I was a child of where I would be now, I would have, I would have just expected more. Now, I would have thought that, that after three decades of following Jesus, that, that there would be more strength, there would be more stability, that I wouldn't be tossed back and forth by, by a headline of some sort, that, I, that, that my day wouldn't be like an emotional roller coaster on occasion, that, that, that my affections for Jesus would not be so much determined by how other people are treating me or my perception of how they feel about me. I, I would have thought that I would have this strength about me, this, this certainty about me that I don't have. I've been a husband for 22 years, and while there are fleeting moments in which I might come close to getting it right, far more than I would like to admit, there are times in which I just think she needs more. She deserves more. And my words are harsh when they need to be soft and, and supporting, and my actions are selfish when they need to be selfless. I've been a dad for 16 years, and, and while I feel like I was a pretty decent dad whenever they were infants, and, and a pretty good dad when they were toddlers and children, I got nothing right now. And I, and I feel it on occasion that they deserve so much more from me. And yet I can't, I can't figure out a way to, to give it to them. We are not as strong as we think we are. If there's any reflection of the church after these last few years, it's that concept. That we have seen a mass failure uh, of discipleship to, to such an extent that I actually told my bosses back in, in Arkansas that, that you actually have grounds to fire me at this moment based on how our church members are responding uh, to the election and to the racial tensions and to COVID. You have the right to fire me in this moment. And, and so they did. And uh, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. They didn't. But we are not as strong as we think we are. And as we turn to Romans chapter 7, I think that basic idea, that basic premise is in a way that brings tremendous comfort to me, the actual idea that Paul is proclaiming. And that while it disappoints me and while I want to be stronger than I am, the truth of the matter is that if you and I can come to an understanding of our own lack, of our own need, if we could recognize that we aren't as strong as we think we are and leave this place with that mindset today, we will actually be far better off understanding our weakness and can actually live better lives, be used of God more knowing that we are not as strong as we think we are. And so we're going to jump back into Romans chapter 7. We, we, so we've been in this series now for several weeks. You remember Paul is writing uh, to the church at Rome, the church that he's going to visit. He wants to set forth the gospel, what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and the whole book is interpreted uh, through the verses of chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. That, that basic premise is this, that you and I are justified by faith. That, that justified, just as if I've never sinned, that that comes as a byproduct, not of our own hard work, not of our own effort, our own accomplishment. It doesn't come by acing the spiritual test, by accomplishing the great task. Instead, you and I are justified by faith, by a trust in God, a recognizing our own inability and saying, okay, God, I trust you, I'm going to follow you. I, I now believe you are the right way. 
And so in chapters 1 through 4, Paul is laying out the plight of humanity. He says in chapter 1 that, that, that we can look at cre- the creative order in and of itself and see that there is a God. That we shouldn't come to the false conclusion that, that, that there is no God, the atheist kind of mindset, or even the agnostic kind of mindset. But instead, you can just look at the intricate knowledge of creation and say there is a God. And then we all know our own weakness, our own need, that we are now separated from the holiness of who God is. And Paul spends chapters 1 through 4 and now laying out the plight of human need and then God's solution that came through Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 5, he, he makes a switch. And, and so 1 through 4 is the plight and the solution. Uh, 5 through 8 now are, are the concept of what's the byproduct of us. So if this is what Jesus has done for us, he's given us this new life, this salvation that we do not deserve, what happens within us? And chapters 5 through 8 now are laying out that we have peace with God and a hope in this life. So God has, God has made us right with himself. We have peace with God, which empowers us to have peace with one another, peace with ourselves, peace with our circumstances, peace inside of us, peace outside of us. And we have a hope. That means no matter the circumstances that are going on around us, that we now have a confident expectation that God is going to make all things right. And so by the time we get to chapter 7, Paul, now writing to a primarily Jewish audience, is going to answer a question that they're going to have. And here's what's going to make today's sermon in this chapter a little bit difficult. It's a question they have, but not one we have. You ever remember in class, growing up in class, somebody would raise their hand and they would ask a question you didn't care about? You just don't listen. And, and if they ask that question in college, like where you don't have to get out of the bell, if they ask that question with less than five minutes in the class, you kill them outside. Because the professor's going to answer that and you're going to have to sit there, right? So the, the, the church, being a primarily Jewish audience, they're, they're going to raise a question that we aren't necessarily going to care about, and yet the answer is something that we should care about. And so Paul spends the beginning of chapter 7 talking about this concept uh, of the law. Well, what is the law? Whenever we talk about the law in the Old Testament, you have several different things that are being mentioned. One is a civil kind of law. So these were the actual laws of the Jewish nation, of the nation of Israel, the, the governmental kind of laws. There was a ceremonial law, which was kind of the religious understanding of, of how you worship the temple, of those kind of things that you actually do. And then you have the moral law. This, is, this would be like the Ten Commandments, right? And so the civil law and the ceremonial law really don't apply to us in any way. I mean, unless you're Jewish, I'm Gentile, and and so they don't apply to me at all. But God's moral law is a universal law that applies to all people in which God is saying, here's how your life can operate in a better way. But not only that, he's actually revealing his character and his nature. And we see in chapter 7, because Paul mentions the idea of coveting, the the tenth of the Ten Commandments, that, that Paul is actually talking about God's moral law in this moment. And what the nation of Israel is asking is simply this. We thought that if we followed the law, we would be made right with God. But you were telling us that that actually we are made right with God through faith. So so what about this whole law thing? And and so Paul is beginning to make an argument to reveal to them and, and then also reveal to us that the law itself was never intended to make people right with God. Instead, it was intended to show humanity's need for being made right with God. And so point number one, God's law reveals our sin but does not keep us from sinning. And so the whole point of the law was the idea that God is going to say, all right, here here are the Ten Commandments, here's what you need to follow now, and yet you're not going to have the capacity to do so. And it's no accident that Paul, whenever he's making the example here, does not say, for instance, do not kill, because you and I would go like, well, we haven't killed lately. But instead, the example he picks up is do not covet. Will anybody top that one? Can anybody say, oh, I've never coveted in my entire life? No. No. And and so the reality is is that we all fail the Ten Commandments on a regular basis. And and yet the Jewish people believe that, man, we got to strive, we got to struggle to obey this. And if we can ever figure it out, then we'll be made right with God. And what Paul is saying here is it doesn't work that way. And and, and then starting in in verse number 14, he goes off on this diatribe that we're going to look at here in, in the passage today. And it's a little bit confusing, but I think we can make sense of it. Let's just read the passage, and then we'll dive back into it. We know that the law is spiritual, verse 14. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. 
I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now whenever we look at this passage, there are two primary ways to to look at it. There's a theological disagreement that takes place here. So so on one, there's this long-standing traditional camp and understanding that what Paul is doing here is reflecting on his own life. Reflecting on what it means to be a follower of Jesus and yet still struggle with sin, still have this old way of life at work within you. And why is it that Christians can do bad things? Now, others, a kind of a new way of thinking now about this is this thought that, no, what Paul's actually doing here is a rhetorical device in which he is using language of what it used to be like prior to coming to Jesus. And that's the reason that the Spirit is nowhere mentioned in here. And Paul is actually talking about an old way of life, which a good number of his congregation are still living in. They don't know Jesus yet, and this is the struggle and this is the plight that they're in. Uh, just, just for fun, let's name these two camps so we can talk about them better. Uh, let, let, let's, let's name this one Kurt Harlow and, and, and this one Mark Clark, right? So, so two, of your, two of your lead pastors, right? I mean, hypothetically, these are the camps that they're in. And, and so they have a disagreement that's going on here. Well, which one is right? You tell me because they're my bosses and I can't, <laughs> I can't critique them at this moment, right? Now, the good news for us is this. While there's disagreement over exactly what Paul is doing in this moment, there is a middle ground. We'll call this the Kevin Thompson way. There is a, there's a middle ground here that, that, that even, even if we are talking about this old way of life that, that no longer exists for us, Paul is going to say that, that there are times in which his old way still is at play within him. So the truth of the matter is this not only explains what life used to be apart from Jesus, But if you're a follower of Jesus, you're telling me these words don't explain your experience? Listen to verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Isn't that our experience? That there there dwells within us now, if you're a follower of Jesus, there dwells within us a desire to follow him, to to obey him, to to trust him. That we want to be the type of people that that when the diagnosis comes our way, we have a a faith that stands. That that, that when the pink slip is headed our way, that that we have this trust that that God is going to provide. We want to be the type of people that when there's chaos all around us, there's this tremendous peace welling up within us. We want to be an example and a a light and and a salt. This is our our desire within us. And, And then we can't hold our tongue when the simplest offense occurs. Given a salvation that we don't deserve, and yet we can go days without even thanking God for the breath that's in our lungs. We can have our eyes and our lives transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then not even forgive the simplest of offenses. When somebody does something to us that we do not like. I I desire to be a man of faith. I desire to be a a pastor who loves and who leads. I I desire to make an influence not only in my life, the life of my family, the life of the church. To to have a ripple impact into the entire world. I desire to be a servant of God. And yet there are times in in which I recognize, Kevin, did, did you even pray today? Was there ever anything you actually attempted to get for God that that would require his intervention? Do you actually have any faith whatsoever? 
And Romans chapter 7 is, is my story in so many ways. And I think what Paul is doing in this moment is he is actually letting down the guard and, and peeling back a, a, a picture of his heart in this moment to say, this is what I still struggle with. And it's powerful. It's not very powerful for me to do it. You understand me. But it's powerful for Paul to do it. Because for these, this Jewish audience, Paul was the ultimate. He was the extreme. He was the most educated. He was the most well thought out. He was the most powerful. He is what had given up the most. He had these miraculous experiences with Jesus. He's now testifying all around the world. Lives themselves are changing based on what Paul is doing in this moment. And Paul himself says, man, the very thing I hate sometimes I do. And the very thing I preach to others to do, sometimes I don't. Jenny, on occasion, very rarely, more out of her grace than out of my ability, Jenny, on occasion, will say, hey, didn't you write in your last marriage book that this is how this should go down? And I will say, yes. And that is true for them, but for us, <laughs> this is how this is going to go down. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, is, is simply this. What Paul is saying here, I think, is that all the knowledge in the world is not going to cause you to live properly. That it's not a knowledge problem. Now, now, we have a knowledge problem. We are ignorant. We do need education. We do need understanding. We need, we need transforming our mind. Jesus himself told us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We need discipleship. We need processes, no doubt. But if you and I aren't careful, we can mimic the concept of the Jews here into thinking, well, if we could just get enough knowledge, we'll figure this out. If you're, a, if you're a Christian for a long time and you, and you like to read spiritual books, how many books on prayer have you read that actually changed your prayer life? It's far easier to read a book on prayer than to actually pray. Now, marriage books will change your marriage. Amazon 1599, friends, partners, and lovers. <laughs> But, but this explains the whole self-help section on Amazon. We think to ourselves that, that if we just read the right book, if we just get the right teacher, if we just get the right knowledge in our hearts, that we can life hack our ways to perfect living. That's what the Jews thought. That's what you and I tend to think as well. But what Paul is saying here is it's not a problem of the mind. That literally what is going on here is a problem with the very nature of what is taking place within us. He says in verse 22, For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. The problem is not a, na a knowledge problem, it is a nature problem. And you and I have a sin-filled nature that no matter how much we train, it doesn't mean we're going to make it right. And you and I know this. We know this. Every single person in this room knows what it would take to lose weight over the next month. We all know that basically speaking, if you would count your steps and count your calories, chances are you would lose weight. We know that. But does that stop me from pulling my car into the in and out drive through <laughs> And as I pull in the drive through I think, oh, I think, okay, you got to be careful here. I'm going to order a hamburger with water <laughs> because it's the fries that are the danger. And I come up to the speaker and I say, I want a number three with a chocolate shake. It's not a lack of knowledge. Ask me in that moment, Kevin, is this the way to lose weight? As I literally suck in right now. <laughs> it's a nature problem, not a knowledge problem. And Paul here is peeling back this basic concept. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do Verse 21, so I find this law at work within me, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. We are not as strong 
as we think we are. And even Paul himself confesses that. So what do we do? In, in response to this reality going on in our lives, because here's the story we can write, and here's the story I think that some do write. That They write the story, as I probably would have as a little boy, we look at these spiritual people, these older people, who are further down the road in faith than we are, and we think, oh, that's what it looks like to be a Christian, that's what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, and all their outward actions and activities to us appear right. We can't look deep within their heart, we don't know their own sinfulness, we don't know their own pride, their own greed, how they covet in that moment, and we think on the outside they're living in a right way. Meanwhile, we're looking at our own lives on the inside, and we understand the ugliness and and the pettiness and the selfishness. And we can write the story to ourselves if we're not very careful. Oh, this Christianity thing doesn't work for me because I'm not like them. But here Paul, who would be the ultimate example, says, no, let me show you my heart for just a moment. And it looks very similar to my 10-year-old boy heart that had just come to know Jesus. And notice the conclusion that that leads him to in verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What a wretched man I am. You know, if, if a non-Christian was watching this right now online, and, and they hear that line, they would say, see, that's the problem with Christianity right there. It belittles people. It berates people. Because literally, let me tell you, dear friend, if I could have you walking out of here today thinking one thing, one thing that I do want you to think as you leave this place is, what a wretched person you are. Tweet that. <laughs> but but here's, what a, here's what a non-Christian doesn't understand about that. A non-Christian looks at that and goes, man, what, what if that's true? What if I begin to believe that? And the byproducts that that will lead to is a life of, of desperation, of, of depression. And, and who wants to live that kind of life? But a Christian hears a different message in that moment. A Christian understands that it's only whenever we recognize our own inability, our own incapability. It's only whenever we realize we are not as strong as we think we are. It's only in that moment in which I say, what a wretched man am I? that I can begin to appreciate the love of Jesus. Because that's who Jesus died for. He, he didn't die for the good to make us a little bit better. He didn't die for those who were following the rules and would get it all right. He died for those who come to the end of their lives and to recognize, I can't do this on my own. I'm not strong enough to make this on my own. I need desperate help. Paul cries out, who can rescue me? And Jesus says, I can. And it's not until you and I recognize, it's not until we get to that point where the end of the rope in which we recognize it's not about striving, it's not about challenging, it's not about making it right, it's not about getting enough knowledge, reading just the right books, until we can get it all together to offer to God what we've got. Instead, it comes to the very beginning of our brokenness and our weakness to say, dear God, help me. And he does. He does. You give me two couples right now, you give me a couple who pretty much has it all together, but there's an internal pride about them in which they think they can figure out life all on their own, and you give me another couple who struggles, who says the wrong things, whenever they fight, who doesn't understand how to handle their money, and yet they recognize their own brokenness, and they're constantly crying out, I need help, and they're going through the process, and they're reaching out, and they're going to the counseling. You give me those two couples, and five years from now, I'll take this couple every day. I'll take the couple who recognizes their need and will admit in the moment, God, I need you. And so this passage ends with the gracious good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are not as strong as we think we are. And that's good news. It's good news. Because it means the weight and the pressure is not upon you. You have been freed from this. Now, here's what scares me about this passage. For the Jew, the thought was this. It's all on me. I have to figure this out on my own. But, but you and I, if, if you've been around church at all, you recognize that that's not true. You know that you can't save yourself. And yet, here's the plight for me and you. We think to ourselves, we have to come to Jesus, and we do. And we think we come to him and get forgiveness, and we do. And then we think, the rest is on us. And we turn the cross into a one-time experience. 
We turn grace into something that we only come and experience whenever we desperately know that we need it. And then we pick up the weight of pressure and try to live this Christian life all on our own. And what Paul is saying in this moment is you are not as strong as you think you are. You can't do it. You cannot do this on your own. And so literally the Christian life is not one of straining and achieving, building more knowledge. The Christian life is one simply of opening up our hands and saying, okay, God, I need you. Come into my life. And, and then in every situation, going, God, I don't know how to handle this situation. God, forgive me how I've handled it wrong, but in faith, I'm going to do the best I can, and, and, and here's where I'm going to go, and, and God, you're going to have to do something with this. For, for me to make it in any way, you're going to have to do something with this. And it is a life of total dependence. This won't be on your screen, but you can listen to it. It goes all the way back to verse number six. We serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The Old Testament, the law, is there to reveal to us our need. It shows us our sin, and rightfully so, and we need to be reminded of that. But the way to Christ is not now, all right, let's try to fix that to the best of our ability. Instead, it is the way of the Spirit to open up our hands in every area of life and to say, okay, God, come and fill me, and I'm going to follow you. Yesterday, a picture popped up on my time hop memories, right, Facebook memories, and Six years ago, yesterday, Jenny and I were sailing on Lake Tahoe with a couple of friends, just living life. Just a little, we would always take vacation the first of June, and so pastoring in Arkansas, Jenny wanted to come to Yosemite, and so we came to Yosemite, and then we drove up to Tahoe, and we're just sailing on the lake. And, and this picture in my photo, it, it shows the lake, and then in the background, it, it shows a snow-capped mountain in the background. Little did we know that six years later, you would be able to walk out my back deck in Auburn and in the distance see that mountain. And if you were to tell me that, Kevin, you're totally in charge of your life, and it's all up to you to, to figure out how to be best used and to to impact the lives of other people and to have the knowledge and to walk the way that you're supposed to walk and, and all the pressure is upon you to make it happen. That would be an awfully difficult way to live life. But the way of Jesus is, Kevin, open your hands. Receive from me the gift of this day. Use it in faith to the absolute best of your ability. And at the end, thank me for it and ask forgiveness for it and wake up the next day and do the exact same thing. And if you and I will live life open-handedly, he will do things in us we can never even begin to imagine, taking us to places we can never even begin to fathom, and accomplishing things through us that we can never do on our own that will always force us to give all glory and honor to him. I am not as strong as I think I am, and that's good news. Because recognizing that causes me to continually lean on him. You see, the moment I begin to have confidence in my strength, I will trust myself to the denial of him. But every day that I live in a recognition of my own weakness, I will distrust myself and follow him. Which one is it for you today? Every head bowed, every eye closed all across this room. I, I wonder if if in just an act of faith, kind of a physical act of faith, I wonder if right where you are, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would just set your hands in your lap and just open them as a symbolism to God. Of God, this is who I am coming to you. I, I literally can bring nothing. I have nothing of value to bring you. I only bring you my open hands. And, and if you aren't a follower of Jesus, that, that might kind of feel awkward at this moment. But recognize the truth of this passage. You can't do it on your own. There is a God. He is holy and just. You can never live perfect enough to appease him. You can never live up to the standard. You couldn't live up to the standard of your grandma. How are you going to live up to the standard of God himself? And so right now, in your own words, in your own way, you can recognize your own need. And you can pray out to God, God, I am not as strong as I thought I was. I need you. 
And you can invite him into your life in the same way I did May 5th, 1988, on my bed as a little boy. To the best of my understanding, I just said, God, come into my life. I'm going to follow you. You can do that right now. If you do so, then as you leave today, we have a prayer table in which some some kind volunteers would love to talk to you. Just what does that mean for you? And how can we assist you? But for every other person in this room, maybe who's already come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I want you to open your hands in your lap and just say, God, I've trusted in myself too much. I want to trust in you. And then I want you to name a specific area in your life, not just a general area, a specific area in which you say, God, I've been trying to handle this on my own. No more. I'm giving it to you. I'm receiving from you the work that you're going to do, and I'm promising to follow you to the best of my ability, knowing I I won't be perfect. Most gracious Heavenly Father, with hands extended open to you, and hearts in desperate need of you. We invite you into our lives, into our hearts, into the work that you have us to do this week. Father, on our own, we cannot do anything of meaning, a purpose, of value, but, but the world is yet to see what can be accomplished by a group of people who have their hands open to you, who are willing to follow. Let that be true of us today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.